I praise and thank God for giving me this opportunity to minister in front of you, especially the last several nights. It has truly been a great joy and a privilege to come here, especially I want to thank Pastor Shibu Thomas and all the leadership as well as all the servants of God for giving me this opportunity. It is really an honor for me because uh, from a young age onwards, uh, I have been listening to Pastor Shibu Thomas's messages. So I never even imagined in my wildest dreams that I will uh, be one day uh, standing in his church and preaching. So it is truly uh, uh, God's faithfulness and God's provision. And I pray that these last couple of nights and yesterday, day before yesterday, was a blessing for the church. It was definitely a blessing for me. And I pray it was a blessing for you. Without much further introduction, I just want to say that um, we, I will be heading back after the service today. Keep me in your prayers. I have a long drive, and I'm uh, still feeling very tired. So keep me in your prayers that I reach there on time safely. Also, my wife gives her special regards, even though she was not able to come. Uh, she was working, but she was watching all the services, even at the hospital. So she's been uh, praying for the blessing of the meetings, and she gives her regards as well. Okay, let's go into the Word of God. Book of Genesis, chapter 22, verse 1. Book of Genesis 22, verse 1. Reads like this, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Okay. I want to apologize in advance to the media team, especially because I gave them another message. I told them I will be preaching from book of Hosea about God in the wilderness. But last night, and I spent some time in prayer, the Spirit of the Lord gave me a very different uh, message to speak on. So I am completely scratching that message and, and preaching something else that the Spirit of the Lord uh, placed on my heart to speak on. So I want to apologize in advance for that. We see here that God is testing Abraham. Now, when we study the scriptures, there's a lot of confusion about testing and, uh, uh, and trials because uh, particularly among our Malayali circle, there's a lot of confusion because in Malayalam Bible, some of the words for these words are used the same. So when we study the scripture, we see number one, temptation. Number two, trials. Number three, testing. Temptation. Trials, testing. Now, in Malayalam Bible, some of these terms are used the same. They use the word uh, parisha, right? They use the word parisha for temptation. They also use the word parisha for testing. In some places, they use the word parisha for trials. And so because of this, there's oftentimes a confusion in this thing. But I want to clear this up. Number one, temptation. I think the best Malayalam word we can use for that is pralobanangal, right? Enticement. What is temptation? Temptation is something that comes from Satan or the enemy or our flesh that causes us to, to wants us to destroy our faith. It has the ultimate plan to destroy our faith, to take us away from the plan of God. Then we have trials. So trials is what, and the best word uh, I can use for that in my language is parishodhanagal, right? Trials. But it's, trials is coming from God. And that is not to destroy our faith. That is to build up our faith. Praise the Lord. Oftentimes we make that confusion. And so when different trials come, we are right? But say, you cannot rebuke a trial. You have to go through the trial. Bible makes it very clear that there will be trials. There will be suffering. But the book of James makes it very clear. I consider a pure joy, my friends, when you face trials of many kind. For it is the testing of your faith that develops perseverance. Right? So it is God's way of building up our faith. Correcting us and molding us and shaping us to be what? Amen to the image of Christ. So God sends us to trials. So there's temptation to destroy our faith. There's trials to build up our faith. And then there is testing. And that is where we can use the Malayana word parisha. Testing of your faith. And what do we do a test for, right? To measure your faith, right? And so what we see here in Genesis is not a temptation. It is not a trial. It is a testing. It is a testing. Now the question we must ask is, why does God feel the need to test Abraham? 
എന്തുകൊണ്ടാണ് ദൈവം അബ്രഹാമിനെ പരീക്ഷിക്കുന്നത് ചുമ്മാ അതാണോ no not right god has a reason behind everything he does the verse starts off like this and it came to pass after these things either kanya what is it after that means we need to understand what happened before let's read the first couple of uh, verses above that Chap- genesis chapter 21 That's verse 32 onwards, I'll read. So then it, they made a covenant. So Abimelech rose with Philip and took command of his own, and they returned to the land of Philistine. Then Abraham planted a teramest tree in Beersheba and then called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. Okay, what we see there is what? Abraham planted a tree and worshipped the Lord. After this, the Lord tested his faith. what is the significance of that well when you study the life of abraham one of the things you see is every place that abraham pitched his tents he built an altar and worship the lord every place ella stalangali abraham oru yaga vidam paninge deiva thayaradichu now he comes to this land the land of the philistines the bible says he stayed there and he planted a tree and worshiped the lord aaradichu nu choichal aaradichu ashe pandathu pol or aaradhana alla ippa kaanunnu he worship that's true but his worship is not the same way that it was before abraham where is the altar yagavida evada poi what happened why all of a sudden a change yeah in between one thing happened in between one thing happened the beginning of chapter 21 what isaac was born before that abraham was praying god give me a son please fulfill the promise and he's crying and praying and trusting god and pleading with god now that the blessing came now that the promise came now that the answer to the prayer came now he's still worshiping but he's not worshiping the way he used to this morning this is the message the lord gave me for the church today udarabad shambaradiya ആരാധിക്കുന്നുണ്ടോ എന്ന് ചോദിച്ചാൽ ആരാധിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് ശരിയാ സഭായോഗത്തിന് വരുന്നുണ്ട് പക്ഷേ ആരംഭ സമയത്തിൽ വെലിപ്പെട്ട ദൈവിക ആരാധന ഇന്ന് രാവിലെ ദൈവാത്മാ കാണുന്നില്ല ക്ലോറി ആത്മാ ചിലരോട് വിരൽ ചൂണ്ടിക്കൊണ്ട് ദൂത് ചോദിക്കുക നിന്റെ യാഗവിടം എവിടെ പോയി വേ ഹാസ് യുവർ ഓൾട്ടർ ഗോൺ ഹോ ചീസസ് അന്ന് നാട്ടിലിരുന്നപ്പോൾ വീസ ഇല്ല ജോലിയില്ല വീടില്ല ആമൻ ഒന്നും ഇല്ല പക്ഷെ അന്ന് ആമൻ ദൈവസന്നിധി വന്നിരിക്കുമ്പോൾ ആമൻ ഒരു മണിക്കൂർ രണ്ട് മണിക്കൂർ അന്യഭാഷ ദൈവത്തെ ആരാധിച്ച കാലം ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു ഇപ്പം അമേരിക്കയിൽ വന്നു വീസയായി ഗ്രീൻ കാർഡായി വീടായി ജോലിയായി കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളായി അവരുടെ ഭാവി സെറ്റിൽഡായി ദൈവസന്നിധി വന്നിരിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് പക്ഷെ കൈയടിച്ച് ഒന്ന് സ്തോത്രം പോലെ ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുന്നില്ല ഹുഡാരമന ഹംദൽ ഖമാന ഗഡഗസിയ ഗ്ലോറി ഗ്ലോറി യെസ് ഗ്ലോറി ഗ്ലോറി യക്തദാ ജയം ഓ പണ്ടത്തെ പോലെ ഒരു ആരാധന തിരിച്ച് വരട്ടെ പണ്ടത്തെ പോലെ ആ പ്രാർത്ഥന ജീവിതം വരട്ടെ പണ്ടത്തെ പോലെ ഒരു ഉപവാസം തിരിച്ച് വരട്ടെ പണ്ടത്തെ ആ കണ്ണുനീർ തിരിച്ച് വരട്ടെ many of us have gone away from the lord after we received many of the blessings of god we have to admit that this morning we have to confess that this morning no, please humbly accept me and they, they, i am nobody to correct and, and, and criticize any one of you here but this morning the spirit of the lord is giving a very clear word that there are some people who have gone away from their first love or samethil kattichondirunna thi ippam ningale veedinte munnil kaanunnu ivinte veedinte agathu kaanunnilla ചില ദൈവദാസന്മാരോട് ദൈവാത്മാവ് ഇങ്ങനെ ആലോചന പറയുന്നു ബൈബിൾ സ്കൂളിൻ്റെ സമയത്തിൽ യാത്രയുടെ യാമങ്ങൾ ചാപ്പലിൽ പോയി ഇരുന്ന് കരഞ്ഞ് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്ന ഒരു സമയമുണ്ടായിരുന്നു ആ അനുഭവം തിരിച്ചു വരണം ക 
come back and build the altar. Come back and rebuild the altar. In the Ravale, Ninda Pamanapi, Ati, Vinan Ali Kapata. Pidak and Mar in a Samayatil, Kapi of David and the P. In the Yale. That's why God is testing Abraham. Either under Paul, when God saw this, then he said, let me really measure how much Abraham loves me. Let me measure what, what, what his real situation in the heart is. That's why God is allowing certain testings to come into some of our lives this morning. To, to measure how far away have we gone. Jesus. There's a verse in the Bible that says what? Your God is a jealous God. He is a consuming fire. Oh, God is telling Abraham, Abraham, if Isaac is the one that made you go away from me, then you give me that Isaac back. Give me that Isaac back. Now we have to understand when we say God is a jealous God, I Malayalam it says, right? Uh, fervent God. But the, the word used there is talking about an anger and, and, and an upsetness, a disappointment that comes from love. What do I mean by that? See, I think the best way to take an example is a husband and wife relationship, okay? When the uh, wife is at home, right? And the, uh, the, the wife is waiting for the husband to come. Right? And instead, when the husband comes, instead of talking to the wife, first thing he does is he goes on the phone. And he's calling his friends, calling his family members, calling everybody else but not paying attention to his wife. Then he turns on the TV and watches the news. And then he goes after the computer. And completely ignoring the wife. How would the wife feel? That feeling of anger, disappointment, hurt, that is that word they use there. Your God is a jealous God. Meaning what? God is saying, I, I love you with an everlasting love. But if something comes in between our love, something comes in between our relationship, I am a consuming fire. I will destroy and remove what comes in between us. That's why God is telling Abraham, let me remove what may have brought you far away. But then he says, oh God, what about the promise? What about the promise that my see my generation will be like the stars in the sky? What about the promise that out of me a nation will come? God is saying, my primary concern is not the promise. My primary concern is you. I don't want a nation without you. I don't want a, a, a kingdom without you. This morning, I am willing to put aside the promise if it means I will get you back. One of some of the times the promises and prophecies spoken over our life don't get fulfilled. It's not because the Prabhupada must uh, saw something wrong. It's because God is putting those things aside until we come back to the place where God wants us to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God said you will be a doctor. That's good. But until you come to the presence of God and live the life where God is expecting you, God will be willing to push aside your career if it means to get you back. God is willing to push aside some of the promises concerning your family life if it means it will get you back. Do you understand what I'm saying? God said, bring Isaac here. And the Bible says it's very, I'm very uh, interesting when we read this. Is the Bible says Abraham and Isaac rose early in the morning and they went on a journey. That's one thing I'm really happy is that Abraham and Isaac went together. Praise God. One of the, and I mentioned this this weekend. Is one of the things we always see is what? 
father and mother worshiping somewhere, children worshiping somewhere else. That is not a biblical pattern at all. Not at all a biblical pattern. And some places, and they may be coming to the same church, but the, the children are in one other building and the adults are in another building. I don't believe that is a biblical pattern either. And I'm saying that because to, to your church will continue to grow. And God willing, God will give you another building where you can worship the Lord. But in that time, remember this. If anybody comes with any ideas that we need a separate worship for the young people, shoot that idea down. Because my Bible teaches me, Abraham and Isaac worship the Lord together. The parents and the children must worship the Lord together in their house. The parents and the children must worship the Lord together in the church. And the Bible says, Abraham carried the wood, the fire, and the knife. In other words, he came prepared for his worship. This morning, what did you bring today for the worship? Our philosophy is this. Our philosophy is this. Because what we see is Abraham went there, prepared everything, built the altar, carried the wood, put the wood there, and then he, he did everything that he needed to for his worship. But our philosophy is this. Our philosophy is this. Let the young people come in the morning and prepare everything. Okay? And then let the worship team come and start the fire. Then let pastor come, kill the sacrifice and put the sacrifice in the fire. And then our job is to come and watch the fire burn. That's not worship. It's your responsibility. Praise God. What are the two things they brought? Number one, a knife, which means what? Something has to die as part of the worship. What needs to die? Romans 12 makes it very clear. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Meaning that for worship to be worship, myself, my flesh, my desires, my will has to die in the presence of God. Number two, they brought fire, which means what? Amen. The, that, 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 that sacrifice needs to burn. This morning, let the fire of the Lord burn in our midst. Let a holy fire burn in our midst. Now some theologians, amen, especially in this day and age, always say, Oh, Devat in the Yatma, Tia, let Tia, It doesn't matter, Tia, Tia, Let that fire burn. When I read my scripture, my Bible says the Holy One of Israel is a fire and the light of Jacob is a, is a flame. Israel the Parishutun or Tiyum, Yaakov in the Velicham or Jualayanam. Ati. But for that to happen, what? The church needs to come prepared with that fire. It's not the worship team putting the fire on you. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You need to bring the sticks to burn. Now, our services are very challenging because at 10 o'clock when the service starts, when we look at the altar, there's no sticks to burn. Some people came, but they didn't bring any sticks to burn. They, they didn't bring anything to offer. Some people, uh, they have the, the sticks to burn, but they're sitting at home. Online, where you want to control it again. They have the verga on one side, a laptop on the other side. Online, I don't know if you can take it, I don't know. Jesus. Now, there are those who are sick, those who are uh, unhealthy and cannot come. They even have a mind to but when you're healthy, when you have the ability to come to the house of God and you still don't come, I mean, even with the restrictions gone, the fire is not going to come through the laptop and on your, on your sacrifice. And some people brought sticks, but it's so wet. No matter how much we try, nothing is catching on fire. Then slowly after the first song, after the second song, a small fire starts to come. Then another group of people who came late, put their sticks on top, and the, the small fire that was burning disappears. Then we have to start again, English worships. 
And then after all this, we, when we were on the way home, he goes, Molly, in the car, my teeth are still there. Any other pastor that there go on the pratik and some get in the air. End up on the day of a crate, cut on the pastor to Joria, the number of Joria. We come with the fire. We come with the sacrifice. We come prepared to worship the Lord. And then Isaac goes and asks his dad, where is the, sac- where is the lamb for the sacrifice? The wood is there, the fire is there, the knife is there, but where is the animal for the sacrifice? Where is the lamb? Now my question is this, the Bible very clearly says in Genesis that Abraham had all sorts of animals with him. Camels, sheep, goat, Horses. Uh, he was a rich man that had so many different animals. My question is, how did Isaac know that he needed a lamb to sacrifice? He didn't say, God, Daddy, where is the horse to sacrifice? He didn't say that. He didn't say, Daddy, where is the camel that we need to sacrifice? He specifically called out that animal. Why? Because he knows the rules behind the worship. And who taught him that? Abraham taught him that. Abraham in his home taught his son Isaac the rule of worship. Let me be very frankly with you speaking. Okay? I learned what it means to worship God, not because a pastor on Sunday taught me that, because I saw my parents do it, and I, they spend the time to teach me that. When we were growing up, we never had a youth pastor. We never had a separate English service. I'm born and raised here in America. We never, half the time, we didn't even have translation. We didn't understand. I didn't know Malayalam back then. We didn't understand half of the things said. But on the way back from church, mommy and daddy were talking to us what a pastor preached today. Making sure that word went inside them. Inside of us. Monday through Friday night, Saturday night, every night before we went to bed, daddy mommy had family prayer. We all sang songs together. We all read the Bible together. Then even though daddy's the pastor, mommy's the one that taught us the word. Mommy explained what we were reading. Taught us the word of God. We're waiting. Oh, we need a a youth pastor for this. We need a pastor to teach us on this. No, 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 no. It starts from within the home. It is true. The pastors will teach their, do their job. To teach the children of God. But it is ultimately the responsibility in the home to teach the young people what does it mean to worship God in truth and spirit. They need to know that they can't just come to the house of God any way they want and worship God. They need to know that there are certain guidelines that the word of God lays down behind our worship. And the Bible says, Abraham said, The Lord will provide. I'm going to conclude here. I know the time has gone. The Lord will provide. And the Bible says, Abraham was just about getting ready to sacrifice Isaac. And the the Lord said, Abraham, do not harm this child. And when Abraham looked, he saw a ram stuck in the bush. And he sacrificed that. Oh, one thing that made me think so clearly about that is what? Our God is a provider. There's different interpretations that some people say the ram was a three-year-old ram. Uh, uh, Regardless, uh, uh, there was a ram ready there to sacrifice on that altar. There the Lord gives a message on the Mount of Moriah. I am the Lord that provided for your need. But not only that, not just for that need. It's very interesting. The Bible says when Abraham came down the mountain, news had reached him that Rebekah was born. What does that mean? 
Abraham, you don't realize it now, but years down the road, your son will need a life partner. I've already prepared that for him as well. Abraham, Pasha Varsangal Ainate, Ninda Maganda Yamsatinavendium, Nan already said the Kairi Vichitonda. He provides for our current need and He provides for our future need. Even before we recognize we have a need, He's already provided certain things for us and our family. Hetraber Vishosikin. Ninda Dalamur Kabendi ever at a Pavi Kabendi, they were already telling the Gadi Vichitonda. Ha, Amana Dalaga Daga the Labar Sandara the Yaragasia. Jesus. And they have a sign of point. Abraham, before Abraham comes on the mountain, he tells his servants, You stay here. We will go and worship the Lord and we will come back. Abraham, aren't you going up there to sacrifice your son? Yes. Don't you have a knife with you that is going to use to kill your son? Yes. Don't you have a fire in your hand that is going to burn your son's body? Yes. Then how can you say, we will come back? That's his faith. That's his faith. And in fact... Book of Hebrews chapter 11 makes it very clear. What was that faith? That even from the ashes, God will raise up his son. In other words, the foundation of Abraham's faith was a resurrection. What is the foundation of our faith? What is the foundation of our worship? It's not that God is going to give me a job or God is going to give me a house. God is going to give me this A, B, and C. No, no, no. The foundation of our worship this morning, the foundation of our faith this morning is what? There is a resurrection waiting for me. Whatever situations I'm going through, whatever struggles I'm going through, amen, regardless, amen, even if I die and my life leaves this earth, when the trumpet sounds, oh, resurrection power will pull me out of the grave. That's why I worship the Lord. That's why I believe the Lord today. Because there's a resurrection waiting for me. Glory, 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 glory. But there's one last, one particular thing I want to say, and I'm going to conclude here. The thing that makes the Pentecostal worship a unique experience is that we are not only a group of people waiting for the resurrection power. That resurrection power is already moving among us. There is a power or resurrection that moves upon the worship. Maricha Poya Vishayang or Jeevi Pikuan, whatever Sandara Viva Kaudavara Hapala, Roga Sauka Meruan, Widal Kundavara, Ha! They were Shakti Yavarikate. Yes! Hudala Panapiara, but Sandara Viva Kauda. Glory, glory, glory. 